This is a film for people, about the city they live in, how the city is changing for the people. A cathedral and university city on a river on the edge of Europe. In 1707, Daniel Defoe visited Glasgow and found it one of the cleanliest, most beautiful and best built cities in Great Britain. In 1707, 13,000 people in Glasgow. In 1707, a treaty of union between the Scottish and English parliaments. The Clyde flowed to the Atlantic. The Clyde was deepened and dredged. Glasgow grew, a mercantile and industrial city in the center of the Western world. In 1807, 100,000 people in Glasgow. In 1907, three quarters of a million. By the middle years of this century, 1,100,000 people living and working in less than 60 square miles. The second city of the empire had run out of space. Its air and river were polluted, its social problems enormous. It had to change. In 1960, work began on the biggest urban redevelopment program in Europe, a 20-year program involving five square miles, a twelfth of the city's area. Between 1960 and 1970, 52,000 houses were demolished in Glasgow. A further 75,000 are scheduled for demolition up to 1980. To make room for new life in the city, for new houses, industries, schools and colleges, hospitals, social and cultural amenities, for new roads linking a planned and integrated community. Noise, dust, confusion, the sometimes painful transformation of familiar landmarks. This is Charing Cross. But Glasgow's future is planned out in the heads of planners, stage by stage, modeled in balsa and plastic, presented to the public and the representatives, argued and approved. Construction work in the Kingston Bridge began in the spring of 1967. Cowlairs Industrial Zone, an integral part of Springburn Comprehensive Development Area. There are 29 of these development areas in the city. By 1970, work had begun on eight of them. Another 10 were in the pipeline. In the city centre, Victorian grandeur, the Duke of Wellington and a bank for the 1980s. The best of the old keeps its place in the new Glasgow. Glasgow's overspill means that in 1980, the population of the city will be 800,000 people. They will have good houses and a revitalized environment that will free them from the cramped conditions of the past. Sir Basil Spencer's high-rise flats in Hutchison Town Gorbals, the first of the comprehensive development areas. Before redevelopment, population density was 460 people per acre. Now, it's 150 people per acre living with light, space, a sense of freedom. Medium-rise housing at Pollock Shields. The redeployment of land formerly occupied by villas means that more people can live in the district and also enjoy a greater openness of vista.
At Ibrox and in other parts of the city, low, medium and high-rise housing are grouped together. Trees are an important feature of environmental planning. In 1969 alone, 33,000 new trees were planted in Glasgow. Between 1960 and 1970, 40,000 new houses were built in Glasgow, either by the corporation or privately. A further 23,000 will be built by 1980. Comfort inside the home, a spacious environment, room to move and clean air to breathe. The goal for housing 1980. The future of any city develops out of its past, and this is not forgotten in the process of change. Some of the best of Glasgow's traditional four-storey sandstone tenements are being modernised. But as Glasgow prepares for the 21st century, the pattern of life changes. Tenement life, with its jilly pieces and wee shops, is disappearing. In its place, shopping precincts, located with new housing and new roads in mind. Shopping precincts themselves traffic free, but provided with parking areas so that cars can serve and not confound the housewife and her family. The supermarket, modern abundance matching modern prosperity. Sholan's shopping centre, the shopping arcade at Gorbals. Shopping 1980 is convenience, safety, supplying the needs of material and physical excellence. Glasgow made up for not inventing football by creating Celtic, Rangers and the Hampden Roar. The city also has a strong schools and club rugby tradition. And men and women with the leisure and energy to play sport as well as just watch it. Bellahusen Sports Centre, the prototype for several to be built in the city, was regularly used by 7,000 members in 1970. Scotland's other national game, golf, at Hags Castle. There are 11 golf courses within Glasgow city boundary, another 12 within a one mile radius. For getting away from the crowds and just walking about among trees and flowers and greenery, Glasgow offers a selection of 62 parks and recreation areas. The Botanic Gardens at the city's west end. A network of walkways linking the parks, extending their freedom as planned for 1980 and the first sections were open to the public in 1970. The calm 
elegance of a former era. St Andrew's Halls, until gutted by fire, Glasgow's principal concert auditorium, is being rebuilt as an extension to the Mitchell Library. In line with the city's general policy of maintaining a balance between old and new, its splendid facade will be preserved. An entirely new cultural centre, including a major concert hall and civic theatre, will provide a focus for the artistic life of Glasgow 1980. The noise of the city's nightlife dies away. And round midnight, the feel of Glasgow, nowhere more than in George Square. A statue of James Watt stands at one corner of the square. His portrait hangs in one of the city's galleries. In the 1760s at Glasgow University, Watt harnessed the power of steam on which the city's merchants and industrialists grew rich. The private houses today enrich the city's public life. Stirling's Library. The Scottish Stock Exchange in the centre of Glasgow, completely modernised inside, its exterior restored. Correlative with the period of Glasgow's greatest wealth was a flowering of architectural genius. Park Terrace, one of the finest examples of Victorian grace. Trinity Towers. The Glasgow School of Art, Charles Rennie Mackintosh's masterpiece. The Mitchell Library, the largest public reference library in Scotland, was endowed in 1874 by Stephen Mitchell, a tobacco merchant. Pollock House, designed by William Adam, was gifted to the city in 1967. Glasgow's patron saint, St Mungo, and Glasgow University. Part of the Burrell Collection, one of the most important collections of paintings and art objects in the United Kingdom, is on display at Kelvin Grove Museum and Art Galleries. A new gallery to house the entire collection is planned for the grounds of Pollock House, and a competition will be held to find the best design. Kelvin Grove Museum itself epitomises Glasgow's Victorian opulence. At the city's Transport Museum, monuments of engineering magnificence. A railway locomotive built at Springburn in the boom years of steam and empire. And at Kelvin Grove, a Clyde-built steamship engine. Glasgow grew rich on the tides of the Clyde. The river itself grew dirtier and dirtier. Strict controls and cleaning up measures are now exercised by the Clyde River Purification Board. And by 1980, the river water will be pure enough to support fish once again. Its banks also will be transformed. Ocean-going shipping will by then be operating chiefly in the deeper waters of the Firth of Clyde. Glasgow docks, Queens, Princes, Kingston, 
will be filled in and the recreated land attractively and usefully deployed. The grim lines of warehouses and waterfront factories will be demolished and walkways constructed so that for the first time in 100 years, the people of Glasgow will have the visual and amenity benefits of the river freely accessible. Time and the river. The river changes and the next generation grows. The newly built Sick Children's Hospital and the Queen Mother Maternity Hospital. The latest medical techniques are available for the newest citizens and their mothers. And the doctors of 1980, studying at Glasgow University's world famous medical school, gain practical experience. At Jordan Hill Training College, the teachers of 1980. Langside College of Further Education. By 1980, as many as 24,000 men and women from all over the west of Scotland region will be receiving full-time education at the city's universities and colleges. Part of a rapidly developing educational precinct near the city centre, Glasgow College of Building, and the young men whose skills will build the new houses and roads offices and factories, hospitals, colleges and schools for their children, for the next generation. <laughs> Newbury Tower, an extension of Glasgow School of Art. The new Glasgow University Library. In 1964, Glasgow's Royal College of Science and Technology was raised in status to a university, the University of Strathclyde, where the city's proud technological tradition, its fund of sheer know-how, is constantly being replenished and advanced. The new Glasgow, with its industrial estates and with the industrial and commercial zones of its development areas, gives its people space to work as well as space to live, greater physical and mental freedom an understanding of what they do. Industrial Glasgow 1980 will not be oil, sweat and back-breaking labour. Commercial Glasgow 1980 will not be mindless columns of figures. Muscle gives place to automation. Heavy engineering to micro-engineering. The age of the computer. world might call these multiples. The world of industry knows them as Glasgow-made jet engine components accurate to within a millionth of an inch. 
Glasgow consumes and produces imports and exports. Its future growth depends on fast, efficient, automated handling of goods. Gushet Falls Rail Terminal in the southeast of the city handles 17 miles of standard international containers a week. Potentially, the Firth of Clyde is a deep water port second to none in Europe. If the vision of ocean span is realized, the Glasgow region will become a vast container entrepôt for the rest of Britain and Europe. Transportation, 1980. Glasgow's highway plan proposes a four and a half mile inner ring road round the centre of the new city, making the central area easy to bypass, fast to get into, fast to get out of, more accessible. On June the 26th, 1970, a symbolic stage of this crucial development was reached when Her Majesty the Queen Mother opened the largest urban bridge in the United Kingdom. Built at a total cost of 11 million pounds, the Kingston Bridge has a span of 880 feet over the waters of the Clyde. Its five northbound and five southbound lanes will carry 70,000 vehicles a day in 1975, 120,000 a day in 1990. The northern approaches to the Kingston Bridge bisect Anderston Comprehensive Development Area. Immediately to the east of the new urban motorway are the glittering glass and concrete towers of Anderston's commercial zone. West of the motorway, along the Clydeside Expressway, are situated Anderston's main housing and industrial zones. The commercial complex will incorporate a multiple level system for a pedestrianised shopping area people and shops on top, parking and services below. Springburn Comprehensive Development Area. New industrial estates, new housing, a new shopping centre, fewer people enjoying more space, closer links with the centre of Glasgow along the Springburn Expressway. Govan Comprehensive Development Area. Redevelopment of the riverside as housing and open space. New industry to the south, and along the links with the Renfrew motorway. Comprehensive development also for Woodside, Pollockshaws, Townhead, Calcaddens, Rayston, Lauriston, Partick, Bridgeton and other areas. Glasgow's highway plan involves the construction by 1980 of 21 and a half miles of motorways and expressways integrated with existing and expanded bus, train and underground services so that optimum coordination of transport is achieved faster, freer links with the Glasgow region and beyond, rationalisation and unification of the city's districts. In the city centre, as elsewhere, the segregation of pedestrians and traffic will mean less noise, fumes, anxiety, a more bustling, thriving commerce, a happier, healthier people. If roads are the bones of the new Glasgow, the flesh is the areas of development and redevelopment. Change on the scale that Glasgow has undertaken inevitably brings with it disruption, dislocation. But the aim is clear, a reorganised and better city. The greater leisure opportunities of Glasgow 1980 are illustrated by the network of walkways which will by then be in existence. The Kelvin Walkway will link up with the Highland Way, taking the hiker on a continuous nature trail to Loch Lomond and points north. The overall plan for the new Glasgow on which the light blue spots represent proposed shopping and community centres, transforms the heart of the city into clean air, uncongested commercial and housing areas, locates industry with people in mind, and with a communications network, makes the city freer and more rational in terms of space, more compact and efficient in terms of time. Above all, it is the communications network which makes clear what direction Glasgow is taking for 1980. Links with the world, from Glasgow Airport, only 15 minutes by car from the city centre, to London, Paris, Amsterdam.
links with the region. 100,000 people come into Glasgow every day to work. Glasgow 1980 is west of Scotland 1980. A city with a future as big as its past. A city of fighters whose response to a challenge is usually bigger than the challenge itself. A city whose energy has perhaps too much in the recent past been frustrated and corrupted into violence by apparently insurmountable social problems. But an energy which today is expressing itself, rediscovering itself through the dynamism of change, difficult but necessary change towards planned freedom, mobility, a more happily coordinated and prosperous society. There's a lot to be done, but the city and its people are doing it, reaching out for Glasgow 1980.